Baruchot Abaot, ladies, and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to Torah anytime or to ohelsara.com, as you know, we are so happy and thrilled, actually, that you log on every single week and that you devote yourself to Torah, to the words of Hashem, to the elevation of your soul, and that you are giving yourself the opportunity to grow, especially during this time of Elul. I would like to dedicate this class for the Rafua Shelema of Rabbi David Hanania Pinto, Ben Arabanit Mazal Madalin, a very, very special Rav, Big Tzadik. He needs tremendous refuot, uh, yeshuot, and we hope that Be'ezat Hashem, not only the Te'ilim that we're saying, which it's so, so beautiful to see the round the clock Te'ilim that's taking place from all over the world, people from all over, of all nationalities and religious backgrounds and affiliation, are constantly saying Tehillim round the clock, whether it's during the week or on Shabbat, and taking upon themselves Sfarim upon Sfarim to recite. But I think what would be helpful for all of Klau Yisrael, including the Rav, is if people took upon themselves also Ma'asim. Hopefully the Shi'ur of today will prompt you to take the necessary actions, and it should be not only L'Refuato, but for the Rufu Shalem of all Klal Yisrael, and when I say that, I mean that really Klal Yisrael is suffering. We need tremendous Rufuot. We need a Yeshua. Um, we're, we're, we're experiencing a sickness of a kind in this generation, and we need to be healed from all of the Tum'ah and all of the external influences that have caused us to decline in our state of spirituality. So Be'ezat Hashem, I hope that this Shi'u and anything that's learned from this Shi'u and more than that, whatever actions are taken as a result of the Shi'u, it should be for the Refua Shlema of Rabbi David Hanania Pinto Ben Arabanit Mazal Madalin and um, we Dafka wrote this Shi'u because he's a big advocate of Shalom he had actually given a speech a few weeks before he got sick with corona about the importance of being b'shalom with one another um, and how that gives HaKadosh Baruch Hu more pleasure and more nachat ruach than the shira of the malachim. And I remember having a face-to-face -face meeting with him via Zoom just weeks before he got sick and we spoke about a particular incident that took place and he was telling me how there's no excuse for people not to be b'shalom. There's no excuse for people not to be b'shalom. So Be'ezat Hashem, in the merit of his constant reassurance and inspiration, um, and in the merit of whatever we're, gonna, we're going to learn here today, Be'ezat Hashem, it should be for his refuah. Ladies, as you know, next week we're going to be celebrating the Yom Hadin, the judgment day of the entire world, Rosh Hashanah. I, I can't believe there's just a week away. We're going to hear the shofar being blown and hopefully it's going to shake us out of our stupor and into a place of true tshuva. You know, there are at least 10 reasons given as to why we blow the shofar. The main reason is because it's Gzerat HaKatuv. It's because God commanded us to do so. And if Hashem asked us to blow the Shofar, really we don't need any more reasons than that. However, the Torah HaKadoshah refers to Rosh Hashanah as Yom Teruah. The day of Teruah. What's a Teruah? In order to figure that out, we have to look at the Aramaic translation of that word. The Aramaic translation of Teruah is Yom Yevava. Anybody know what a Yevava is? 
because it seems like we're given a substitute word for Torah that we don't understand either. So now we have to try to figure out what a Yevava is in order to understand what a Torah means. And once I understand what a Torah is, I can begin to understand what the Shofar represents. So I'm going to remind you of an incredible story that we read in Sefer Shoftim, a story that I've mentioned quite a number of times. There was a general, an anti-Semite, who waged war against the Jewish people. His name was Sisra. Sisra was a tyrant who was undefeated in battle. And at that time, the leader of the Jewish people was a woman, a Neviah. She was a prophetess named Devorah, alayha shalom. She was a judge over all of Am Yisrael. She was a Shofetet. Devorah decided that we must enter into battle with Sisra and overthrow this tyrant. So Sisra rode out towards the Jewish people with 900 chariots and HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a miracle. The ground underneath his horses became boiling hot and that caused the, the feet of the horses to burn. As a result, instead of riding towards the Jewish people, the, horse, the horses led the chariots towards the water away from the Jewish people because they wanted to cool, cool off their feet. But when they arrived at that body of water, HaKadosh Baruch Hu did to Sisra's army exactly what he did to Paro's army. All of Sisra's men drowned in that body of water. Sisra was the only one who remained alive from his entire army. So he ran away and he ended up in a tent of a Jewish woman named Yael. Yael was a righteous woman. She saw Sisra approaching her tent and when he asked her if she could provide him with, a, with something to drink, instead of giving him a cup of water, she gave him a cup of milk, of warm milk. She was smart. Warm milk makes you sleepy. Sisra became tired and he fell asleep in her tent. While he was sleeping, Yael took the peg of the tent, the, the stake, and she used it to kill Sisra through his temple. Sisra, the tyrant anti-Semitic general, was defeated by two Jewish women, Dvorah Nevi'ah and Yael. That's the basic story. Now, Sisra had a mother who was very proud of her son's expeditions. She had a custom that whenever her son went out to war, she'd wait by the window in order to watch him come home with all the spoils from his victories. The, this mother considered her son a tremendous hero. On that day that Sisra did battle against the Jewish people, that day was not different than any other day. Sisra's mother stood by the window. Be'ad ha'chalon nishkefa. Vateyabev em Sisra. Through the window, the mother of Sisra looked forth and peered. She stood there, waiting for her son to return from battle. She waited and waited, but Sisra was not coming home. And we know why. He was lying dead in Yael's tent, but his mother didn't know that. So she says, Madua boshesh lavo. Why is his chariot late in coming? Madua echeru pa'ame markevotav. Why are the strides of his chariots tarrying? Sisla's mother began to feel concerned for her son. All of a sudden, she takes out what the Pasuk calls a eshnav. What's an eshnav? Eshnav is a crystal ball. She knew how to tell the future through this crystal ball. 
she peers into the crystal ball and she sees two women. When she saw them, she thought, ah, I know where my son is. Racham, rachamataim lerosh gever. He's probably taking advantage of those two Jewish women. He must have won the war. And these are the spoils of the war, these two women who he's now violating. But then she continues to peer into the crystal ball and she sees red. And she says, ah, I see a spoil of dyed garments to Sisra. Shalal tzvaim rikma, a spoil of dyed garments of embroidery. Tzva rikmataim letzavrei shalal, dyed garments of embroidery for the neck of the spoiler. My son is probably taking all the beautiful and colorful clothing that the Jewish women own, all the accessories and all the embroideries. He's keeping it for himself. She puts the crystal ball on the side and she continues to wait. But Sisa is nowhere in sight, not even in the distance. And suddenly, Vateyabev em Sisa. That word, Vateyabev, sounds very familiar. It sounds like the word Yevava. What does the word Vateyabev mean? Chachamim explained that it means that Sisa's mother began to cry. She cried because she didn't know where her son was. So she tried to imagine where he could possibly be. Perhaps he's visiting the local pub. Maybe he became drunk over there. Maybe he went out with the soldiers to celebrate the victory. She's crying and crying and trying to imagine where he could possibly be, possibly be. And still, there's no sign of her son. Finally, after some time, Sisa's mother comes to the conclusion that her son is dead. And the Navi ends with the words, Ken yovdu chol oivecha Hashem. So may all your enemies perish, God, in the same way that Sisa did. That's the basic story of Sisra. And we just learned an important word in Hebrew. The word vateyabev means to cry. Which means that the word yevava means a crying. And that means that the word teruah is a crying sound. So that's how we learn that when the Baal Tokea blows the shofar, He's supposed to do it in a way that emits a crying sound. Yom Teruah is Yom Yevava. It's a day of crying through the shofar, through the instrument that invokes tears. But the Gemara asks, how do people cry? And the Gemara explains that people cry in three different ways. Some people cry like the sounds of the shavarim. Do, do, do. In a crying sound that would be boo, hoo, 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 like that. Some people cry like a teruah, which is a, a series of quick sounds. Do, 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 like boo. <laughs> Some people cry like that. Some people cry in both those ways. They begin with the shavarim sound and they continue with a tuah sound, like. <laughs> like that. And then he says, some cry, the Gma says, like a toa, which is a long sound. <laughs> like that. So when we blow the shofar, we use a combination of all three sounds because we're not sure which of the crying sounds is the one that's supposed to be the most effective and stirring. But I have a question. Could it be that the source of what kinds of sounds we need, we need to emit from the shofar comes from Sisla's mother? She's a Gentile woman who approved of her evil son's ways. 
How could the mother of this anti-Semite be the example of the crying that we elicit on Rosh Hashanah through the sounds of the shofar? I mean, wasn't there a more appropriate place to learn about the sounds of the shofar other than Sisa's mother? Can we learn about the sounds of the shofar from righteous women in the Torah? Of all of the women in the Bible, they couldn't find another woman's crying to use as, a, as an example for the sounds of the shofar other than Sisa's mother? What about Rachel Imanu? She would have been a perfect role model. She cried and still cries. Rachel mevaka al baneha. Me'ana le'inachem. What about Le'ah? Le'ah, her whole life was crying. Why couldn't we use them as the source for the crying sounds of the shofar? But no, the source for the yevava, which is the teru'ah of the shofar, came from Sisra's mother. How can that be? The blowing of the shofar is a holy mitzvah, and the source of its yevava sound is Sisra's mother? That's baffling if you think about it. What could the answer be? Ladies, today we're going to learn something that I hope you'll take to heart as a lesson of life. As you know, somebody who suffers from an addiction, like an alcoholic, he joins a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. In this program, there are 12 steps until a person is completely clean of his addiction. The 12 steps are meant to lead the person to recovery. The first step, however, is the most important step. Step one is the hardest of all the 12 steps. Step one is admitting in front of all the people there at this program who are present that you are indeed an alcoholic. Where you get up and you say, my name is Plodi Almoni and I'm an alcoholic. You first have to admit that you're guilty of being an alcoholic. Once you've taken step one, you could move on to step two. Now we assume that step one is the easiest because why else is the person sitting there in the program if he wasn't an alcoholic? Of course he's an alcoholic. The easiest part should be the admission of guilt over your addiction. But the alcoholic knows how hard it is to admit that he has a problem. Usually when they go around the room in these meetings, it's, it's not always smooth sailing from the beginning. When a person is asked, well, why are you here? He might say, my wife brought me here. Or he might say, well, I want to make my family happy. And they said that uh, I would make them happy if I joined this group, so here I am. Or when these people are asked, are asked if they drink, they say, yeah, I drink, but I have it under control. I have it under control. The worst <laughs> is when they say, I have no idea why I'm here. I mean, so <laughs> I have no idea, I have no clue. Most alcoholics have a very hard time admitting their guilt. Many people sitting in those groups aren't always to, willing to take responsibility for their actions, and they're going to try to pin the tail on some scapegoat out there other than facing themselves. No one wants to admit their guilt that they've made terrible mistakes. Human nature is such that it's difficult for us to admit that we have a problem, to admit that we're wrong, to admit that we're guilty. It's, it's very hard for us to take full responsibility for our terrible choices and our horrible actions. The nature of man is to exonerate himself of the mistakes that he made by pointing the finger at other people. So we say things like, uh, well, the reason I have this issue is because of my parents and how I was raised, because of the house that I grew up in. Uh, the reason I got into this mess to begin with is because I'm not really happy in my marriage. Uh, the reason I'm behaving this way is because my therapist recommends it. The reason I'm acting this way is because my friend brought me to this breaking point. The reason why I'm like this is because I don't know what. Human nature is such that the brain wants to protect the person from getting hurt. 
And when a person looks at himself in the mirror and says, Khatati, I made a terrible mistake, that can be emotionally devastating. So the brain creates all sorts of excuses and manipulations in order to defend the person from his bad behavior. And that protection absolves the person from admitting his wrongdoings. It offers him a, a way out of saying the words, I was wrong, I'm guilty, I shouldn't have chosen this ugly path, no matter who happened or what happened. Using other people as our ticket out of accepting responsibility for our crimes is called terutzim, excuses. Human beings are experts at shifting the blame. And I'll give you an example of this from the Torah HaKadosha. It's an example that's meant to show us that even if you're a great person, it's still not easy to admit that you made a mistake. Chachamim tell us that even Rabbanim, great people have a hard time admitting they made a mistake all the more so when they guided someone incorrectly. It's hard for them to say, look, whatever I told you, whatever advice I gave you, I, I was wrong. I shouldn't have given you that advice because the consequences of the advice that I gave you was so terrible, I, I was wrong. So the example that the Chachamim give of, from the Torah is concerning a king that we all know called Shaul HaMelech, Alav HaShalom. Shaul was commanded by Shmuel HaNavi Alav HaShalom through the word of God to eradicate all of Amalek, men, women, children, even all the animals. So Shaul went and he killed everybody except for the animals and the king of Amalek. When Shaul returned, Shmuel heard and saw the animals in the distance. So he turns to Shaul and he asks, kol hatzon. What, what are all these sheep doing here? What, what's the sound I hear of the sheep? And Shaul says, well, I, I brought them from Amalek. We could use them to offer sacrifices to Hashem. So Shmuel tells him, what do you mean we could use them as offerings, as korbanot? You were commanded to kill the animals as well. And Shaul, what does he reply? He says, no, 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 I fulfilled the word of God. Shmuel cannot believe what he's hearing. What do you mean you fulfilled the word of God? You were supposed to kill the animals and you didn't. So you rebelled against God. You didn't fulfill the word of God. And Shaul says, well, uh, I, I, I listened to the people who wanted to bring back the animals in order to sacrifice them to Hashem. Chachamim say that Shaul was trying to come up with all kinds of excuses and justifications for the wrong that he committed. And finally, after the third round of arguing with Shmuel, what does Shaul finally say? He says, Chatati, I sinned. But by that time it was too late and Shmuel removed Shaul from his position as king of Israel. Ladies, notice how long it took Shaul HaMelech, the chosen king of Israel, to say the word Hatati, and he was the king. It's not easy to admit you made a mistake. It's not easy for people to admit that they were wrong. And it's certainly not easy when you think you have some backing. Uh, a someone or people who gave you the haskama, the prescription and the allowance to do the wrong which they're certain is right. How does the saying go? Every group feels strong once it has found the scapegoat. And that's what happened to Shaul. He found all kinds of scapegoats, literally, with all kinds of terotzim all kinds of justifications to excuse his sin. That was Shaul. Hachamim tell us that on his level, David HaMelech also made a mistake. 
נתן הנביא עליו השלום קים תה דוד, אני אעשה דוד. You have a big dilemma that involves a woman named Bathsheba. The first word that David uttered from his mouth when he heard this was the word Hatati, I sinned. And because of that, the Navi said, Vesar avoncha vechatatcha techupar. Because you admitted that you did wrong, your sin will now be removed from you and your iniquity will be atoned for. God will forgive your indiscretion because you admitted that you were wrong to have gone about things in the manner that you did. David HaMelech was not removed from his position as king. Shaul was, but David was not. Why? Because it took Shaul a little longer to admit that he made a mistake. That's the difference. David was Maida. He admitted his wrongdoing and he didn't pin the blame on anyone or anything other than himself. Therefore, he maintained his position as king and in Hashem's eyes he became elevated. Therefore, Chachamim teach us that those who are able to confess and admit that they were wrong receive blessings and a higher sense of self as well as a spiritual elevation. But those who live on Fantasy Island, denying what they did and excusing their behavior by blaming others, by pinning it on what others advised them, like Shaul did. What did he say? The people made me do it. I was only trying to make them happy because they felt that bringing the animals back would be the best thing to do. We did it for the sake of Hashem. Hachamim says such people are living a lie. And when you're living a lie, you only sink into a deeper black hole of further wrongdoings and more excuses and more justifications. Chachamim tell us that such people lose their status in the eyes of Hashem because they're too stubborn to see where they went wrong, why they went wrong, how they went wrong, and who led them in that direction. So that was a story from the Navi we could learn from. Let's learn a story from the Chumash, from Sefer Bereshit. If you remember, Cain killed Hevel. At that time, there were only four people in the world. Adam, Chava, Cain, and Hevel. Cain killing Hevel was the greatest homicide in history because Hevel dying meant that Cain killed one quarter of the world's population. So this was a terrible crime to kill your brother in cold blood and then after you killed him, you left him laying there and you walked away? What happened after that? Hashem confronts Cain and asks, Ayei Hevel Achicha where is your brother heaven? And we all know the answer to that question. We all know where heaven is. We know that Cain killed him. But what does Cain tell Hashem? Lo yadati. I don't know. Hashomer achi anochi? Am I my brother's keeper? What should I be his only address? Why are you asking me? What, am I his babysitter? I'm sure he's somewhere. I'm sure he's alive and well somewhere, but I don't know where he is. That's the way our teachers taught us that this is what happened in school. That's what they taught us. But if you open up the Midrashim, you come across a mashal, a parable that explains Cain's answer to Hashem. The Midrash tells us that there was once a thief who went to rob a particular town. That town had a shomer. They had a security guard posted right outside the gate of that town. And somehow this thief managed to kind of get through the guard, broke into a house, and he was caught. He was caught. When they brought the thief to court in order to face the judge, the judge asked him, what do you have to say for yourself? 
the thief looked at the judge and said, Your Honor, it's not my fault. I'm a thief by profession. I was only doing my job. That's what I do. I steal. If you want to know who's really guilty, it's the security guard. He's the one who didn't do his job. Why am I the one who's being blamed? If the security guard had done his job well, I wouldn't have made it through the gates. So if you want to blame someone, Your Honor, if you, uh, I'm not the one to blame. Not me. It's not me. It's the security guard. This is the mashal that the Midrash states. Ladies, do you know what Chachamim say that Cain should have answered Hashem when Hashem asked him, where's your brother? Cain should have replied with one word. He should have said the word, Chatati. If he would have said that word, you know what would have happened? HaKadosh Baruch would have been more lenient and he would have dealt with Cain mercifully. He would have appreciated Cain's admission of guilt. But instead, like so many of us, Cain had to blame someone else for his unforgivable actions. One thing is for sure, he wasn't going to blame himself for the decision that he made to kill his brother. But you see, Cain had a big problem. Because today, in our day and age, if we want to, we have many people that we can pin the blame on. We have a multitude of different people that we could use as the excuse for why we made the horrible choices that we made. Today, we could blame our teachers, we could blame our parents, we could blame our siblings, our rabbis, our therapists, our spouses, we could even blame our children, our neighbors, our friends. They made us do it. It's their fault that we did what we did. It's their fault that we behaved the way we behaved. It's their fault that our life looks the way it looks. Makayim had a huge problem because if he wasn't going to blame himself, who would he blame at that time in the world? He can't blame heaven because heaven's dead. He killed him. He can't blame his parents because they had nothing to do with what happened and, and they had their own issues because they were still trying to correct their mistake of eating from the forbidden tree and being banished from Gan Eden. So who's left for kind to blame? He doesn't want to blame himself. He can't blame Hevel. He can't blame his parents. So who's left? Whose fault must it be? So Cain brazenly tells HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaShomer Achi Anochi. You know whose fault it is? It's you, Hashem. You're the Shomer. You're the security guard of the entire world. You didn't do your job. Hashomer Achi. You know who's the one who's supposed to be the protector of my brother? It's Anochi. Anochi Hashem Elokecha. It's you, God. It's you. Hashomer Achi, the one who should protect my brother, is the Anochi Hashem Elokecha. It's the one and only one true God. What do you want from me, Hashem? Brothers fight. And you're the referee. So you didn't do your job. If Hevel was killed, it must be your fault, Hashem. Hashomer Achi. The protector of my brother is Anochi. Wow. Could you imagine that? Notice what extremes a person will go to in order to defend himself from admitting guilt. From admitting guilt. Notice who he's willing to blame just not to look inside himself and recognize the truth of his horrific actions. He'll even blame God. Cain's reasoning was so warped that, that he thought that God must have wanted Hevel dead because if he's the protector of the entire world, if he's the Shomer and he sees everything and he didn't prevent Hevel from being killed by his brother, then whose fault is that? That's Hashem's doing. Hashem must have wanted that to happen. It's not his fault. Hashem made it. Ha Hashem let it happen. Could you imagine the lengths a person is willing to go to just not to take the blame for something 
that he was not only a part of, but that he himself implemented and carried out? What a chutzpah. The Zohar Kadosh states that if you look at the Aseret HaDibot, if you look at the Ten Commandments, which were etched on two tablets, you'll notice that there were five Dibot on one side and five Dibot on the other side. Now we usually read the Aseret HaDibot vertically, from top to bottom, like this. But try reading them horizontally, like this. What's the first Dibra on the right side? It begins with the words, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. And what does it say on the left side? Lotiotzach. Thou shalt not murder. So the Zohar Kadosh reveals to us that the Torah is hinting to us that the first Lotiotzach was blamed on the Anochi. Anochi Lotiotzach. Hashem says the first murder in the history of the world was pinned on me. I was blamed for it. No one was able to admit guilt for the murder, for the destruction. Nobody wanted to say it was me. You know, Chachamim tell us that generally children learn their bad behavior from one of two places. Either they learn it in school, meaning their external environment, or they learn it from their parents in the house. When Adam Rishon ate from the tree, the only people involved in that story were Adam, his wife Chava, and the Hayat Sadeh called the Nahash, the snake, that's it. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu confronts Adam and he says, Hamin ha'etz asher tziviticha levilti achol mimenu Achalta? Did you eat from the tree which I commanded you not to eat from? You know what Adam should have said? Chatati Hashem. Yes, I ate from the tree. Step one from the 12 steps in the rehabilitation program. I did it. It's me. I'm the sinner. If he would have admitted his guilt, says the Zohar Kadosh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu would have been more merciful. It would have been easier to move on to step two of the rehabilitation program called Teshuvah. But instead, Adam says, Ha'isha asher natatali, the woman that you gave me as a wife, she made me do it. Classic. Adam blames his wife. It's my wife's fault. She made me do it. She convinced me to do it. She advised me to do it. So who does Adam blame really? He blames two individuals. Ha'isha, his wife. Asher natata li. And he blames God who gave him the wife. So Adam shifted the blame in two different directions. He shifted it towards his wife and then towards the Ribbono Shel Olam. And that was his way of saying, this is not my problem. This is not my problem. It's not, it's not my fault. I was only listening to my wife who advised me to eat from the tree. And, and, and if I was wrong to listen to her, what could I do? You brought this woman into my life. You created her and you gave her to me. What should I do? So. It seems that Cain learned the trait of shifting the blame onto others from his father, also from his mother. But listen to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Adam regarding his punishment. Because you listen to your wife, cursed is the ground because of you. I don't understand this. What, is this why Adam was cursed? I mean, I thought Adam was cursed because he ate from the tree. This pasuk should have read, Ki achalta min ha'etz asher tziviticha levilti achol mimeno. Since you ate from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from, arora adama be'avurcha. Because you ate from the tree, the ground is now cursed because of you. But that's not what it says. 
the pasuk says, Ki shamata lekol ishtecha. Because you listen to your wife. That was not the sin. The sin was not that Adam listened to his wife. The sin was that he ate from the tree that HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded him not to eat from. So why is this pasuk written this way? You know what the explanation is? HaKadosh Baruch Hu was saying, because you blamed your wife, because you shifted the blame, you'll be punished according to your words. If you would have simply owned your mistake, instead of trying to shift the blame, if you would have taken responsibility for the crime that you could committed all by yourself, you committed it, regardless of what your wife told you, you would not have been cursed. And that was your biggest avera, Adam, that you placed the blame of your own indiscretions and the decision that you made to eat from the tree, you blamed it on your wife, as if you don't have your own mind. As if somebody forced your hand, as if you couldn't make your own decision and not eat from the tree regardless of what somebody was telling you to do. So Chachamim tells us that eating from the etzadat, that was a big sin. But a bigger sin was that everybody was pointing fingers and trying to place the blame on somebody else other than themselves. That's why in Sefer Yirmiyahu, the Navi Yirmiyahu, Lava Shalom, states, Hineni nishpat otach al omrech lo chatati. You are being judged for the fact that you claim lo chatati. I have not sinned. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Yirmiyahu, you know why there's severe judgment in the world? It's not because you sinned. It's because you were confronted by messengers that I sent, by messages, by Musarim that I sent your way in order to make you aware of your crime. And you know what your reaction was? Your reaction was, Al Omrech, that you actually say, Lo Hatati, I didn't sin, I didn't sin. That's something that angers Hashem. When a person creates a destruction, when he hurts another person, or even himself, and he shifts the blame onto something else, or someone else, or on the victim himself, on God, on the rabbi, and everybody else other than himself, that angers HaKadosh Baruch Hu more than the sin itself. Because imagine a person who's, who's, who's reciting the vidui, and you hear him, and all he's saying is, Lo chatati, lo aviti, lo pashati, lo ganafti, lo hichravti, lo dibarti, lo biziti, lo hichshalti, lo chisalti, lo naelamti, lo kilalti, lo kilkalti, lo pagati. We're watching him, we think he's crazy, and he's standing there before, Boy, Olama, the great day of judgment, what, what, what for? What for? You're saying, Lo hatati. You're saying it's not your fault, you're saying you're not to blame, you're saying you have good reasons for why you did what you did, what are you standing there for? But in reality, Chachamim tell us, most people view themselves as innocent when it concerns some of the sins that they engaged in, and they cling to many validations and excuses just as long as they don't have to say the words. The truth is, I was wrong. Many of us deep in our hearts, we assume that we haven't committed many of the items that are written on the list of confessions, sadly. You know, I recently heard a, a shiur by Rabbi Mansour where he says that even the confessions we recite which we deep down know we're guilty of. We know we're guilty of. We're still offering other people and God many justifications and reasons as to why we engaged in those averot. We actually think, he says, that our justifications are, are, are valid because we think they're valid. And he says something very interesting. He said that we actually think that our justifications are going to be accepted by the one above 
who knows the real truth. Not the truth we think is the truth, but the truth that God knows, and the truth that God knows the extent of our sins, and who helped us commit those sins. And if he b'chlal agreed to those sins, we're so sure that we know what God's chashbonot are. Sadly, many of us live in the world of lo chatati. Many of us live in the world of yeshli sibat tova I have a very good reason why I did what I did. Many of us have a long list of who is to blame for our errors and sins and inadequacies. And Chachamim tell us, by the way, that there's one word in Lashon Kodesh that usually introduces the excuse we're about to give as to why we sinned. Anytime a person wants to give an excuse of why he sinned, he'll always use the following word first. What word is that? Aval. But. Or however. We all know that word quite well. There's a fam famous saying that says, Nothing somebody says before the word but really counts. <laughs> you understand? The, that word aval, say the Chachamim, is a major excuse word. And we use it all the time. I shouldn't have done that. But. I love you. But. I know I hurt you. But. I was going to take another route. But. I didn't want to do it. But. Chachamim tell us that whenever we hear that word, aval, you know the person is trying to escape from the truth, from his wrongful actions, and even from himself. Try not to use that word, because you'll, you'll know and you'll realize as you're saying it, that it's an escape route. But here's the question. If you look in the Sidul, especially the Sidur of the Edot HaMizrach, in the words concerning the daily vidui that we recite, we say the following words. Listen to what we say. Ana Hashem elokenu ve'elokei avotenu. Please, our God and the God of our forefathers, tavo lefanecha tefilatenu. May our prayers come before you. Ve'al alam malkenu mitchinatenu. And please, our king, do not ignore our supplication. For we are not so brazen, nor are we so stubborn, Lomar, to come before you, God, and to say, Tzadikim anachnu velo chatanu. We, we're not so brazen to come before you and to say that we're so righteous and that we have not sinned. And then we say, Aval, however. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. I wouldn't have put the word Aval in the vidui if Chachamim are telling us that's the key word that we always use as an excuse to run away from admission and from guilt. I would have gone straight to the words Chatanu, Avinu, Pashanu. We have sinned, we have erred in a grave way, and we have committed tremendous crimes. Anachnu, us, Vavotenu, and our forefathers, Ve'anshe Betenu, and those who are in our household as well. Why did the Chachamim add the word Aval, however? Because it sounds like we're about to confess, we're confessing, but, but, as if we're trying to justify and rationalize our indiscretions, as if to say, we're not so brazen and we're not so stubborn to say that we're tzaddikim and we didn't sin, but, but, <laughs> the worst word you could include in the vidui is the word Aval. But it's there. Why? So let's scan the entire Tanakh to see where else this word aval appears and if it has another meaning other than however or other than but. And sure enough, the word appears in Sefer Bereshit concerning a story you're all familiar with. 
If you remember, when the brothers sold Yosef, alav shalom, they held a meeting that included nine out of the ten, uh, out of the twelve shvatim. They came together to form a bet din, which Chachamim say, what kind of bet din could it be? Because Yosef was not present, and they concluded that Yosef was guilty of various crimes. They all des de uh, decided that he deserved to be punished. They took a vote and the decision was unanimous. Guilty. The Midrash actually states that they wrote on a parchment that Yosef was Chayav. He's guilty. So they took Yosef, their brother. They threw him into a pit filled with snakes and scorpions. And eventually they sold him to Ishmaelim. The Midrash says, after they sold him, they were so proud of what they did because they really thought they were doing the right thing. So they sat down and broke bread. They ate a hearty sauda with bread and with wine and we're asking them, what are you celebrating? What are we celebrating? Oh, we're celebrating the fact that we finally got rid of a bad person in our life. Oh, thank God, they're out. Now, anytime you get rid of something that's not good, it's supposed to be a positive thing. So the brothers thought that they were finally rid of this bad seed in their life, and they felt that it was worth celebrating. So they sat down to a se'udat mitzvah. They were so confident that what they did to their brother, that it was right, that it was hagun, now I have a question for you. Chachamim ask, did the Shvatim observe Yom Kippur? According to the Rabbanim, they did. The Midrash says that they observed the entire Torah, although it hadn't yet been given on Har Sinai. Which means, ladies, that every Yom Kippur, from the time they sold their brother, they must have contemplated their ways and asked themselves, did we engage in any avirot we should consider and maybe correct? They decided, nah. I mean, did we do any avirot that we're forgetting about? Nah. Is there anything we need to consider that maybe, maybe we failed, maybe we failed? Do we fail anybody? No. For 22 years, Yom Kippur came and went, and they felt that what they did to Yosef, their brother, was correct, that it was the only way, and that it was the right way. They lived for 22 years thinking that the crime they committed against their brother was justified. And 22 years later, HaKadosh Baruch Hu manipulates the events in such a way that the brothers have to go down to Egypt in order to purchase food because of the famine in the land. Unbeknownst to them, Yosef is now second in command of the entire land of Egypt. And when they arrive, boy do they run into great difficulties, tremendous troubles, because all of a sudden, Yosef, the viceroy of Egypt, accuses them of being spies. Meraglim atem. And then he takes Shimon and he throws him into jail. And then he demands that their youngest brother, Benjamin, be brought down to Egypt if they want to see their brother Shimon again. And lest he wage a whole entire war against the Shvatim. Whoa, they're in trouble. They're in deep mud. And at this point, the brothers begin to ask themselves, well, why is this happening to us? Why is this happening to us? When Nisyonot challenge the tzaddikim, they begin contemplating their ways and they wonder, what did they, what did they do wrong to deserve this difficulty in life? They try to connect the dots to see if their troubles are related to some sin that they committed. When things go wrong in our life, we have to try to correct it by considering where we may have gone wrong. 
So when the brothers were faced with all these charges against them, and after Shimon was taken prisoner, and now they have to bring Benjamin down to Egypt, they began to do some serious soul searching. They didn't attribute their troubles to, to bad mazel or to ein hara. You know what they said? Listen to what the pasuk says. Vayomu ish el achiv. And each man said to their brother, they turned to each other and made the following declaration. Aval ashemim anachnu. Aval, we are guilty for selling our brother. And that's why this is happening to us. 22 years later, they finally recognized the truth. They finally came face to face with the reality that they made a terrible mistake, regardless of how right they thought they were. But what does the word aval mean in Sefer Bereshit, in this context over here? According to the Targum Onkolos, Alava Shalom, Aval means Bekushta. You know what Bekushta means? It means Be'emet. In English, it would be translated as indeed, indeed, it's true. Which means that when the brother said, Aval, Ashamim Anachnu, they didn't mean to say, however, they didn't mean to say, but, rather, aval, yes, indeed, it's true. Ashamim anachno, we are certainly guilty. That's the real meaning of the word aval that we recite in the vidui. And what we're telling a Kadosh Baruch Hu is, Hashem, we're not so brazen or stubborn that we think we're such tzaddikim, that we haven't sinned, no. Rather, we're approaching you with no more excuses, no more justifications, no more validations. There, there, there's no one we're gonna pin the blame on. We're here to recognize the truth. Aval, indeed. Hatanu, avinu, pashanu. We sinned. We erred gravely and we committed terrible crimes. And not just us, everybody around us, and even Anshem Betenu, our very own household, Aval, indeed, we truly sinned. So we say in the Vidui, Hashem, I'm not going to stand before you so brazenly and claim that I did nothing wrong. Nor will I excuse my misdeeds with all kinds of excuses and justifications even if I think what I did was right and even if all those who are unshaped by Tenu thought that what I did was right. Aval, indeed, Hashem, Hatanu, indeed, Avinu, indeed, Pashanu, we were mistaken. Hachamim say that Hashem hears these words. He smiles and he says, what an amazing tikkun is taking place here. What an amazing tikkun because Cain blamed me for committing murder. Adam blamed his wife and me for eating from the tree and bringing death to the world. Shaul didn't even want to admit his wrongdoing until the very end. And the Shvatim thought they were right and pointed fingers at Yosef until they got into trouble. And here, Thousands of years later, the Jewish people are actually turning to me and saying, we're not putting the blame on anybody else or anything else. We were wrong. Aval, indeed, we sinned and we're not going to deny it. We're not going to deny it anymore. And now I want to go back to Sisa's mother. Ladies, you don't have to be a big psychologist to know what Sisa's mother was doing by the window on that day. She knew that her son always came back and he did so from hundreds of battles. He always came back at the same time. He was never late. And as usual, she had the custom of peering out the window as she waited for his return. But he was not returning. 
So she took out a crystal ball and saw women. And then she sees red. And you know what Sisa's mother started to do? She began giving all kinds of excuses as to why her son was late. He's probably at the inn drinking with his friends. He's probably engaged in all sorts of immorality with the women that he's captured. He's undoubtedly dividing all the spoils from the battle. You know why she was conjuring up all those excuses? Because she didn't want to face the reality that her son was no longer going to return because he was dead. She simply couldn't face that truth. And the Chachamim tell us, when a person refuses to face the truth and he ignores the reality of what really took place, do you know what he does? He starts pointing fingers in other places. He tries to come up with all kinds of justifications and reasons and validations and excuses. Sisla's mother is a classic example of somebody who's in a state of denial. And somebody who lives in denial is in a sad state because he's not willing to face the truth or deal with the reality of his life's circumstances. Such a person is living a facade. Think about it. If Sisla's mother really wanted to be honest with herself, when she looked into that crystal ball and she saw red, what, what do you think she should have thought? What would you have thought if you saw red in that crystal ball? You'd think of blood. Chachamim says she should have realized that that was the blood of her son. She should have considered the possibility that somebody out there killed him. But her denial was so strong that she painted in her mind a completely different picture than what the reality was. All of a sudden, red was not blood. Red's not blood. She decided it must be red garments, red embroideries that her son must be taking for, taking for himself from the spoils of war. She fabricated a lie in her mind in order to avoid the truth. When she saw the two Jewish women in the crystal ball, Devorah and Yael, who were known to be strong women, she should have realized that Sisla may have just come to his demise as a result of these two women. Instead, she constructed an immoral picture in her mind that her son was probably violating them and that's why he was delayed. But the point is, Chachamim say that all the signs that Hashem was allowing her to see so that she could arrive at the truth, she read in the total opposite way. She chose to see the opposing reality. So Sisla's mother was the classic example of a person who offers up all kinds of excuses because he simply doesn't want to see the reality for whatever reason he doesn't want to see it. Whether he refuses to see it himself or because others are preventing him from seeing the truth. So the Torah Dusha tells us, do you know what the purpose of the shofar is? When you hear the sounds of the shofar, it's meant to remind you of the crying sounds. Teru'ah is yevava. And when we hear the yevava, we're supposed to remember Sisla's mother. Vateyabev em Sisla. When we hear the sounds of the shofar, we're supposed to say to ourselves, no more excuses. We're not pointing fingers anymore. We're not going to be like Sisla's mother trying to come up with all kinds of justifications. So Sisla's mother is the source of the sounds of the shofar because the purpose of those sounds is to remind a person that enough is enough. Own up to what you did. Hatati, 
Stop blaming people for the horrible ways in which you behaved. Stop justifying your misdeeds. What, are you seriously going to walk around your entire life thinking that you didn't do anything wrong and that the, that the wrong that you engaged in was actually right? Chachabim say, if that's how you enter into Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, we feel badly for you because you're never going to arrive at step two of the rehabilitation program called Teshuvah. Your tshuva is just not going to be complete. So this year, ladies, when you hear the crying sounds of the shofar, picture Sisla's mother standing by the window, giving all kinds of excuses as to why her son is late. And that vision in your mind of Sisla's mother should prompt you to say, enough, 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 I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Aval, indeed. Indeed, I cannot blame anyone else for the choices that I made. For the choices I made. I'm not a little child. I want to be a person who thinks for herself and decides for herself and has a sense of self. And if I'm going to keep using other people and my life as the excuse for why I did what I did or how I did what I did and why I did what I did, how am I ever going to do tshuva? How am I ever going to accomplish anything from my own being? I need to stop justifying my actions and I need to stop lying to myself and to other people because deep down in a place I just don't want to admit, in that place like Sisa's mother, in that, in that place, that place that's denying things, that place of denial, in my dark state of denial, I still know the reality. And the reality is, aval, 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 yes, indeed, chatati, aviti, pashati. I made a big mistake, I sinned. May we all come to this level of understanding. Ladies, the good news, is that when you have the courage not only to look at the truth in the face and to tackle it head on, but you act upon it. When you actually say the words, Aval Ashemim Anachnu, Borei Olam says, I'm proud of you. And despite your indiscretion, I'm going to allow that truth and your admission of guilt to set you free. I'm going to conclude with this idea, ladies. This month is Elul. The letters of Elul rem represent the idea of Ani le dodi ve dodi li. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. But today I want to present to you a new chidush of what Elul represents. In Hebrew, there is a word called lo, spelled lamed aleph. Lo means no. Chachamim say we're all busy saying lo, lo, it wasn't me, lo, it wasn't me, lo, I didn't do anything, lo, I'm actually good, lo, lo, it wasn't my fault, lo, it wasn't me who got into this mess, lo, it wasn't me who did this or that, lo chatati, lo chatati. But eventually, you have to move from the word lo to another word that means it's him. Him being you, you. That word is spelled lamid vav, and it's also pronounced as lo. So basically, the purpose of this month of Elul is to move yourself away from the lo with an aleph, where you're constantly negating the truth, constantly negating the reality and the admission of sin, and move over to the law with a lamed vav, where you're pointing the finger back at yourself. Shift the law that says, it's not me, it's them, to the law that says, it's him, it's him, it's this person here, it's me, that's the key. We have to make sure that by the time we enter into Rosh Hashanah, we manage to shift that part of us that's always negating the sins we committed and move into the world of law, 
of Lamed Vav, where we're pointing the finger back at ourselves and admitting that we sinned. We have to transition from a place of saying Lo Chatati to a place where we say Aval Chatati. Indeed, Lo. It was indeed this person over here. Indeed, it was me. Ladies, it takes a big person, it takes a lot of courage to be able to look deeply into ourselves and to admit that nobody else is to blame for the choices that we made and the consequences of those bad choices other than ourselves. You know, Rav Chaim Brim, Alava Shalom, once presented a famous mashal concerning a person who did not do the proper tshuva during the days of Elul. The mashal is about 10 men who decided to escape from uh, prison. Nine out of the 10 men escaped. When the warden came in the next morning, he saw w one man standing there and he asked, well, where's the rest of the group? And the man said, oh, th they all escaped. And the warden asked, and you? How come you didn't escape together with the rest of them? Ew, Ashan, he starts to beat this guy. That's the mashal. What's the nimshal? Says Rav Chaim Brim. Every Elul HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I gave you so many opportunities to escape from the prison of Averot and Pishaim that you locked yourself into. Every Elul, I create for you openings to release yourself from all the wrongdoings that you committed. Why didn't you escape? Why didn't you take advantage of all those opportunities that I gave you? Why didn't you do the proper teshuvah? But then Rav Chaim Brim says, honestly, I don't understand this mashal. Why was the man who didn't escape punished? He should be rewarded, not punished. The one should see him standing there all by himself and render him a tzaddik. That of all the people in the jail, he's the only one who stayed. He, never, he didn't escape. The ones who escaped should be punished and maybe they should be regarded as Rashaim. Why is this poor guy being punish, punished? Why is the warden beating him up? You know why? Well, the question is, you know why the nine inmates escaped? That'll answer your question. Says Rav Chaim Brim, the reason they escaped is because they knew that they were guilty. And they were scared of the judgment. And they were scared of being tried. They had a yir'ah. They wanted to escape from prison so they shouldn't have to face the judge because they knew that they were guilty. But you know why the tenth man stayed behind? Because he didn't think he did anything wrong. Oh. Lo chatati. Wasn't me. This tenth man had no yir'ah. He had no fear to stand in front of the judge because he was sure that he's going to be found innocent of all the charges brought against him. So the warden tells the man, you tipesh, and maybe even a rasha, of all the people here, you're the one that we have the most evidence against. There's a file stacked up against you for all the horrible crimes that you committed, and not only you commit, you were an accomplice to, and you didn't escape, you had the chance to escape, you didn't escape. The fact that you didn't even attempt to escape means you're a big chutzpan. Because you were willing to come before the judge and claim your innocence when you're so guilty of so many crimes, you were going to stand before the judge and say, Lo chatati. For that, you're going to receive a bigger punishment. For the fact that you couldn't admit your sins and that you actually thought that you were innocent and that you actually thought of yourself as the big tzaddik, that's why you're being punished. More than you would have been had you escaped. There's only 
A few more days left to this month, ladies. And whoever isn't involved in correcting the wrongdoings or perfecting their character, without saying it, you know what they're really saying? Without saying it, they're saying, I don't think what I did was wrong. I'm innocent. And even if I did something wrong, I have a good reason. And I have a way out. My escape route is other people. I can point fingers and I even have my supporters who gave me the right to do the wrong. I'm innocent. Lo hatati. Hafuch. Hafuch. I was even a tzaddikah. I was even a tzaddik. I even, I'm donating money in, in the month of Elul to charity and I'm even doing so in the most righteous of ways, anonymously. I'm davening. I wake up early in the morning to daven and I'm reciting Tehillim all day long. That's why I'm not scared to stand in front of Borei Olam and Rosh Hashanah. That's why I'm not going to do anything to correct my ways because really Hashem, I'm innocent. I might even venture to say that I'm a victim and not the transgressor. Therefore, I'm not afraid to come before you Ibn Oshel Olam and the Yom Haddin because you know Hashem, you know. I'm going to stand in front of you Hashem and I'm going to say, Lo hatati. Hashem, you know I really didn't sin. You know I'm innocent. You know the truth. So the warden comes along and says, I gave you a lul in order to escape. I gave you a way to get out, hand delivered to you. And you didn't escape. You're a chutzpan. Everybody else was smart. The rest of your friends knew what they were guilty of and they knew they were in big trouble. So they took the escape route and they freed themselves. But you, you weren't afraid of the judgment because you were so sure that you're going to be deemed innocent by the judge. You were a little too sure of yourself. You were sure that Hashem knows. Hashem does know. And he doesn't just know your truth, because your truth seems to be skewed. It seems to be uh, 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 the buts, the avals of the buts and the howevers of the excuses and the justifications. Ha'emet zarakim Hashem. Your truth is not the truth. The truth is only with Hashem. Only with Hashem. It doesn't lie in your circles. It doesn't even lie with you. It doesn't lie with the people around you. Zerakito. Rakito. So, ladies, our avodah during the Yamim Nuraim is to stop the vicious cycle of denial. And Be'ezat Hashem, when we're going to begin to take responsibility for our sins, when we'll allow the Shofar to be our guide, when the sounds of the shofar will direct us towards the corrections we need to make, when the crying sounds will conjure up in our minds Sisa's mother and her yevava, her denial, and then we'll come to the realization that what? We can no longer excuse our actions. It's then that Hashem says, you know what? You're, you're on the road to recovery. You're on the road to recovery. Yiratzon, that we should receive from Hashem the clarity of mind and heart to do what is right and just in His eyes, according to His truth. And Be'ezat Hashem, when we'll face that truth and stop pointing fingers, Hashem will say, Umodeh ve'ozev, the one who admits his wrongdoings and he leaves the sins behind, never to commit them again. Yeruham, to him I will be merciful. To him I am going to give an extra measure of mercy. Vesar avonchem, and your sins will dissipate. Vechatatchem techupar, and your indiscretions will be atoned for. But not only that, you are going to be zayche to have a blessed year, to have a successful year, to have a good year, to have a happy year, and to have a year of special shmirah v'atzlacha. Amen ken. Mihiratzon.